Hello, this is the Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster, Chapter 17, Unwelcoming Committee. Humbug whistled gaily at his work, for he was never as happy as when he had a job which required no thinking at all. After what seemed like days, he had dug a hole scarcely large enough for his thumb. Talk shuffled steadily back and forth holding the dropper in his teeth. But the full well was still almost as full as when he began, and Milo's new pile of sand was hardly even a pile at all. How very strange, said Milo, without stopping for a moment. I've been working steadily all this time, but I don't feel the slightest bit tired or hungry. I mean, I feel like I could go right on the same way forever. Perhaps you will, the man agreed with a yawn. At least it, it sounded like a yawn. Well, I wish I knew how long it was going to take, Milo whispered as the dog went by again. Why not use your, why not use your magic staff and find out, replied Tok as clearly as anyone could with an eyedropper in his mouth. Milo took the shiny pencil from his pocket and quickly calculated that, at the rate they were going, it would take each of them 837 years to finish. Um, pardon me, he said, tugging at the man's sleeve and holding the sheet of figures up for him to see. But it's going to take 837 years to do these jobs. Is that so? replied the man without even turning around. Well, you'd better get on with it then. But it hardly seems worthwhile, said Milo softly. <laughs> worthwhile! The man roared indignantly. What? I, all I meant was that perhaps it isn't too important, Milo repeated, trying not to be impolite. Of course it's not important. I wouldn't have asked you to do it if I thought it was important. Important. And now, as he turned to face them, he did not seem quite so pleasant. Well, then why bother? asked Tok, whose alarm was suddenly ringing. Because, my young friends, he muttered sourly, what could be more important than doing unimportant things? If you stop to do enough of them, you'll never get to where you're going. He punctuated his last remark with a villainous laugh. <laughs> then, you, then you must, gasped Milo. Quite correct, he shrieked triumphantly. I am the terrible Trivium, demon of petty tasks, worthless jobs, ogre of wasted effort, and monster of habit. The humbug dropped his needle and stared in disbelief while Milo and Tok began to back away very slowly. Don't try to leave, he ordered, with a menacing sweep of his arm, for there's so very much, very much to do, and you still have over 800 years to go on your first job. But why do only unimportant things? asked Milo, who suddenly remembered how much time he spent each of his days usually doing just that. Think of all the trouble it saves, the man explained, and his face looked as if he would be grinning an evil grin, if he could grin at all. If you only do the easy and useless jobs, you'll never have to worry about the important ones, which are so difficult. You just won't have the time. For there's always something to keep you from doing what you know you really should be doing. And if it weren't for that dreadful magic staff, you'd never know how much time you were wasting. As he spoke, he tiptoed slowly toward them with his arms outstretched and continued to whisper in a soft, pleasing, deceitful voice. Now... 
Do come and stay with me. We'll have so much fun together. There are things to fill and things to empty and things to take away and things to bring back and things to pick up and things to put down. And besides all that, we have pencils to sharpen and holes to dig and nails to straighten and stamps to lick and points to earn and scores to beat and DK percentages to raise and ever so much more. Why, if you stay here, you'll never have to think again. And with a little practice, you can become a monster of habit too. They were all transfixed by the Trivium's soothing voice. And just as he was about to clutch them with his well-manicured fingers, a voice cried out, RUN! RUN! Milo, who thought it was talk, suddenly turned and dashed up the trail. RUN! RUN! It shouted again, and this time Talk thought it was Milo and quickly followed him. Run! Run! It urged once more, and now the humbug, not caring who said it, ran desperately after his two friends with the terrible trivium close behind. This way! This way! The voice called again. They turned in its direction and scrambled up some difficult, slippery rocks, sliding back almost at each step, just as far as they'd gone forward. With a very great effort and many helping paws from Tok, they finally reached the top of the edge at last, but only two steps ahead from the furious Trivium. Over here! Over here! advised the voice, and without a moment's hesitation, they started through a puddle of sticky ooze, which quickly became ankle-deep, and then knee-deep, and then hip-deep, until finally uh, they were struggling along through what felt like a waist-deep pull pool of peanut butter. <laughs> the Trivium, who had discovered a mound of pebbles, which needed counting, stopped following, but stood at the edge shaking his fist, shouting horrible threats, and promising to rouse every demon in the mountain before returning to the mound of pebbles. What a nasty fellow! I gasped Milo, who was having great difficulty just getting his legs to move. I hope we never meet him again. I do believe he stopped chasing us, said the bug, looking back over his shoulder. That's not what worries me, remarked Tok, who had stepped from behind the stepped out of the sticky mess. But what's ahead? And keep going straight! Keep going straight! counseled the voice as they continued to pick their way carefully along the new path. Now step up! Now step up! It recommended, and almost before they knew what happened, they had all taken a step up and then plunged to the bottom of a deep, murky pit. <laughs> but he said up! Mil Milo complained bitterly from where he lay sprawling. Well, I hope you didn't expect to get anywhere by listening to me, said the voice gleefully. We'll never get out of here, the humbug moaned, looking at the steep, smooth sides of the pit. That is quite an accurate evaluation of your situation, said the voice coldly. But then why, why did you help us at all? Shouted Milo angry, angrily. Oh, I do as much for anybody, he, re he replied, the voice. Bad advice is my specialty, for as you can plainly see, I'm the long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster. And if I do say myself, I'm one of the most frightening fiends in this whole wild wilderness. With me here, you wouldn't dare try to escape. And with that... It shuffled to the edge of the pit and leered down at its helpless prisoners. Tok and the humbug turned away in fright. But Milo, who had learned by now that people are not always what they say they are, reached for his telescope and took a long look for himself. And there, at the rim, far at the top of the hole, Instead of what he'd expected, 
stood a small furry creature with very worried eyes and a rather sheepish grin. Why, you're not long, sh long nosed, green eyed, curly haired, wide mouthed, big necked, broad shouldered, round bellied, short armed, bow legged, or big footed. And you're not frightening at all, said Milo indignantly. What kind of demon are you? The little creature, who seemed stunned at being found out, leaped, leaped back from the sight and began to whimper softly. I'm. I'm the demon of insincerity, he sobbed. I don't mean what I say, I don't mean what I do, and I don't mean what I am. Most people who believe what I tell them go the wrong way and just stay there, but you and your awful telescope have spoiled everything. I'm going home. And crying hysterically, <laughs> he stamped off in a huff. <sighs> certainly pays to have a good look at things, observed Milo as he wrapped up the telescope with great care. Now all we have to do is climb out, said Tok, placing his front paws up as high on the wall as he could. Here, hop up on my back. Milo climbed onto the dog's shoulders. Then the bug crawled up on top of them both, and by standing on Milo's head, just managed to hook his cane around a root of an old gnarled tree at the top of the pit. With loud complaints, he hung doggedly on while the other two climbed out over him and then pulled him up after, somewhat dazed and discouraged. I'll lead the way for a while, he said, brushing himself off. Follow me and we'll stay out of trouble. He guided them along five narrow ledges, all of which led to a grooved and rutted plateau. They stopped for a moment to rest and make plans, but before they had done either, the whole mountain began trembling violently. And with a sudden lurch, they rose high in the air, it rose in the air, carrying them along with it. For quite accidentally, they had stepped into the callous hand of the gelatinous giant. And what have we here? He roared, looking curiously at the tiny figures huddled in his palm and licking his lips. He was an incredible size even sitting down with long, unkempt, greasy hair, bulging eyes, and a shape hardly even worth speaking of. In fact, he looked very much like a colossal bowl of jelly without the bowl. How dare you disturb my nap? He bellowed furiously, and the force of his hot breath tumbled them over in his huge hand. We're, we're terribly sorry, said Milo meekly when he'd untangled himself and stood back up. But you looked just like part of the mountain. Naturally, the voice, the giant replied in a more normal voice, but e even this was like an explosion. I have no shape of my own, so I try to be like whatever I'm near. In the mountains, I'm a lofty peak. On the beach, a broad sandbar. In the forest, a towering oak. And sometimes in the city, I'm a very handsome 12 story apartment house. I just hate to be conspicuous. It's really not safe, you know. Then he looked at them again with hungry eyes and wondered how they would taste. Y but you look much too big to be afraid of anything, said Milo quickly, for the giant had already begun to open his mouth wide. I'm not, he said with a slight shiver that ran all over his gelatinous body. I'm afraid of everything. That's why I'm so ferocious. 
If the others found out, I would just die. Now do be quiet while I eat my breakfast. He raised his hand toward his gaping mouth, and the humbug shut his eyes tightly and clasped both of his hands over his head. Then aren't you really a fearful demon? Said Milo desperately on the assumption that the giant had been brought up well enough to not speak with a mouthful. Well, approximately, yes, he replied, lowering the arm to the vast relief of the bug. That is, comparatively, no. What I mean is, relatively, maybe, in other words, roughly, perhaps. What does everyone else think? There, you see, he said peevishly. I'm even afraid to make a positive statement. So, please stop asking questions before I lose my appetite altogether. And he raised the arm again and prepared to swallow the three of them in one gulp. Then why don't you help us rescue Rhyme and Reason? Then maybe things will get better, shouted Milo again, this time almost too late, for in another instant, they would have all been gone. Oh, I wouldn't do that, the giant said thoughtfully, lowering his arm once more. I mean, why not leave well enough alone? That is, it will never work. I wouldn't take the chance. In other words, let's keep things as they are. Changes are so frightening. As he spoke, he began to look a bit ill. Maybe I'll just eat one of you, he remarked unhappily, and save the rest for later. I don't feel well. I have a better idea, said Milo. You do, interrupted the giant, losing any desire to eat at all. Oh, if it's one thing I can't swallow, it's ideas. They're so hard to digest. I have a box full of all of the ideas in the world, said Milo, proudly holding up the gift that King Azaz had given him. The thought of it terrified the giant, who began to shake like an enormous pudding. Put me down and just go away, he pleaded, forgetting for a moment who had hold of whom. And please don't open that box. In another moment, he'd set them down on the jagged peak, on the next jagged peak, and with panic in his eyes, lumbered off to go tell the others of this new terrible threat. But news travels quickly. The word snatcher, the trivium, and the long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-tailed, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster had already spread the alarm throughout the evil, unenlightened mountains. And out the demons came. From every cave, from every crevice, through every fissure and crack, from under rocks and up through the mud, stomping, shuffling, slithering, and sliding through the murky shadows. And all had only one thought in mind. Destroy the intruders and protect ignorance. From where they stood, Milo, Talk, and the Humbug began to see them moving steadily forward, still far away, but coming quickly. On all sides of the cliffs, they were alive with this evil, shadowy collaboration of crawling, looming, creeping, lurching shapes. Some could be seen plainly, but others were just dim silhouettes, more idea than material, and yet still more, 
only now beginning to stir from their foul places, would be along much sooner than the three of them wanted. Run! Wait, better hurry! Bark talk, or they're sure to catch us! And he started up the trail. Milo took one deep breath and did the same. And the bug, now that he knew what lay behind, ran ahead with renewed enthusiasm. 